Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. The anticipation that we all feel, I have felt when I read Dr. Weischer's first, not first book, but second book, first for me, <coughs> Histories of Consciousness. And um, it really touched home for me. And I was so excited to hear that Dr. Weischer then wrote The Golden Thread. And when I saw him in the Paragon building, he suggested that I read it very slowly. And I did. And I made a lot of dog ears on it because I knew that I would have a lot of questions. And um, I saw Dr. Weischer in Gourmet Gallery, and I was so excited to tell him that I finished reading his book. And I said, would it be fun to have a question and answer uh, opportunity for your fans? And right away, I thought about Ginger Martin. Uh -oh. <laughs> Ginger Martin. <laughs> Ginger and James sponsored a book signing for Dr. Weischer as well, Bell Blue. And, um, and then this all came together. We wouldn't be here if it were not for you, though. So thank you very much for coming. Um, Julie Malucci, I want to say thank you also because she's been doing a lot of promotion and um, support for Dr. Weischer. Ginger Martin and James. Patricia Laporte for allowing us to be here today. Um, gave us some wonderful treats and um, a beautiful venue. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weischer, and we're going to have a fun night. If you have any questions, please feel free um, once the opportunity comes. We have a mic, and um, the wonderful cameraman would like for you to come here and ask your questions so that you can be filmed. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, at least you'll have the mic where you're sitting so that the audio will be very clear. So um, thank you very much. Have fun. And um, we'll look forward to the Q&A as well. Thank you. Um, but anyways, thanks for coming tonight. Um, uh, one of the things I've always wanted to stress in writing this book is that this book is not about me. This book is about you. It's about all of us. It's about where we came from, why we're here, and where we are going. One of the things uh, it, it, for me throughout my life is I had perhaps somebody would say the disadvantage and other I think it was an advantage, advantage that when I was in school uh, I was labeled mentally retarded and I was taken out of the eighth grade and put in with special ed and uh, they didn't know what to make of me and uh, and I think that gave me a uh, really a tremendous advantage because it, it warped my frame of thinking in the form of what Socrates said. Socrates' famous statement was, the first thing is, I know nothing. And I think that is the proper substrate to start in any endeavor, any intellectual endeavor. The first thing is, I know nothing. And then follow the data from there. All too often, through church or religion or through, through the, our upbringing, we're taught a certain way. And it's really hard to get out of that paradigm. I didn't have that, that th disadvantage because when you're retarded, you don't know anything. So that's yeah, yeah. where I started from. Um, I wanted to show something here. Let me see if I can get this back on again. This was not in the book. I did not put crop circles in the book because crop circles are so questionable. Uh, we don't know. But I thought this was interesting because this crop circle uh, was in 2011 uh, in uh, Porino, Italy. Porino is up in the upper uh, western corner of Italy. This was overnight. And this is really incredible because to understand this crop circle, you have to have a firm grasp of, of a Sumerian history, and you also have to have a firm graph, grasp of digital uh, numbers, computer math. And I had both. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, for me, computer science and mathematics and everything was so uh, easy for me. That's how they discovered that I perhaps wasn't mentally retarded, because I, I was doing all the geometry uh, uh, exams for all the kids. And so the, the principal of the school was a private school, invited himself over by my parents' house and said, I refuse to leave this house until you promise me you're going to be an engineer. And that's how I became an aerospace engineer. I helped develop the computers 
uh, for the F-14 Tomcat, and then the, the B-1 bomber. I was initially involved with the B-1 bomber. Did two weeks on the space shuttle, but they didn't need me for much because my systems were already working, so I just drank coffee. But um, this, look at this for a minute here. It's rather interesting. Number one, this is a seven-pointed star. Well, we know the, in, in 500 B.C., they discovered a, a clay tablet that had the map of Babylon, and it was shaped as a seven-point star. So this goes back to the Akkadians. This here, notice here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight little dots there. Well, remember the Commodore 64? Remember that old computer? A Commodore 64, because this was it, this what it was based on, and it read on a certain language called ASCII 2. Uh, computer nerds call it ASC 2, but it's really ASCII 2, and President Johnson made that international in the 1960s, but it really dates all the way back to World War II and was the original numbers. And I just want to show you briefly, quickly, real quickly, uh, how it works. It's, it's kind of interesting. So you understand the language of what we're getting at. And so computers work by a thing that's called a flip-flop. All right? So if you put a pulse in here, you get a pulse, you get a pulse here. If you put another pulse in here, you get a zero. You put another one in here, you get a pulse. So this is half this. So if you put four of these in line, like this, it counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it goes one, zero, one, zero. This goes one, one, zero, zero. And this goes, this is four. So this goes one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And this goes one, 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 up to eight, and then zero, zero. Now, so you have basically, th this is called a register here. And this is how it reads. Every number represents a character, a letter, a number, uh, uppercase versus lowercase. And so this is called ASC2. Here. This here, if you read this, it is in the same language, the same original computer language. Here we go. E, and this one is A. Who was EA? EA is Sumerian for the same person here as ENKI, Enki. Enki is the, is the uh, Akkadian word for Ea, which is the same person. This requires knowledge of both Sumerian history, Akkadian history, computer history, in order to be able to discern this out. And so I don't think somebody just came over in there and did it, because it was done overnight. Nobody made any noise. And I've often wondered if some of these crop circles may be actually a signal from the Anunnaki. These are the people who came from the heavens above. That's the definition of Anunnaki. Came from the heavens above. And maybe an indication that someday soon they will come back. And I believe, I often believe there's going to be two kinds of people on this planet if that occurs. Those that are informed and those that are not informed. And I think what I wanted to do with this book is, is say, listen, this is a possibility. Because this is where we came from. Now the next thing here. This is the problem. When I was a kid, I always looked at everything from the cerebral point of view, probably because of my history of being labeled mentally retarded. That's the way I look at things. But this was the problem. This is an evolutionary chart, okay? And then all of a sudden, we've got one-third the brain. Even though they get bigger, the brains are always one-third. And then all of a sudden, 450,000 years ago, we get size of the human brain. There's no pathological, paleontological record from, a, from an evolutionary standpoint as to how this occurred. There's none. It's zero. There should be a mountain of evidence because it's so re recent. It's so high up in the strata. There should be a mountain of evidence. But we don't have it. We have nothing. But if you read the Akkadians, if you read 
uh, the ancient Babylonians in Sumerian texts. It's called the Enuma Elish. They tell you what happened. They say 435,000 years ago, they came from the heavens above, and they took the highest primate, probably Australonithecus, and entered their DNA, and that's how they got a brain. One of the things that convinced me of this is a guy named David Hassler. David Hassler is the director of bioscience and evolutionists and the GNA. He was part of the GNA gnome, the whole discovering the GNA, the DNA. And he's in um, uh, the University of Southern California at Santa Cruz. He discovered the area of the DNA that is responsible for animal embryological development. Now, this is great. This ought to be a, a really tell us a lot what's going on. Well, it so happens that it's on chromosome 20, and it's on the long limb of chromosome 20. And what he discovered was that did you know that the going from the, chimp from the ch chicken to the chimpanzee is roughly 300 million years, even though we know that the chimpanzee didn't come from the chicken. All right, 300 million years. Going from the chimpanzee to the human is roughly 7 million years, okay? Did you know that this portion of the DNA going from the chimp to the human, which is only 7 million years, is nine times more complicated than going from the chicken to the chimpanzee, which is 300 million years? Now, some people look at that and they go, isn't evolution wonderful? Well, I believe in evolution like everybody else. I look at the same data and I smell a rat. Something happened. And the Sumerian and, and the evolutionary record, the, uh, the paleontological record is, yes, 450,000 years ago. And that's exactly what our forefathers said. That's when it happened. That's when they came down. That's when the Anunnaki came down and created. Why did they do that? Because they wanted servants. They wanted someone to be able to take instruction. But they went too far. Somebody named Enki. And that's what you heard the name was Enki and his wife Ninma. They were very, very good at bioscience. Ninma was really good. And so they decided to go one step further. Why just have humans, develop humans to work the mines? Why don't we have them in our own palaces? Why don't we have them personal ones? And why don't we make a custom one to do it? They were not supposed to procreate. They were not supposed to understand judgment, but they did too good of a job, and they had to be cast out. Why did they have to be cast out? The Bible says that they had to be cast out, but why? The reason is that to the world of the Anunnaki, DNA is gold. It is their most precious thing, and that is not to be tampered with. That is not to be manipulated, and so consequently, they had to be separated. And, but, by the same token, Enki was very concerned about survival of humans, still, to this day. So what they did is they would send people down to make sure that we survive. Now, the other flip side of the coin is a guy named Enlil. I'm sure some of you remember Enlil reading the book. He was the, the real boss. Enki was just sort of like a cohort, second in command. He was the one that was really in command. Now, he was like the God of the Old Testament. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You guys don't shape up. We're going to wipe you all out. Enki wasn't like that. Enki was the more compassionate and wanted to, wanted to save humankind. I want to show you one other thing here. I went to Peru and uh, with uh, Gary Rosenthal. I don't know how many of you people here know Gary Rosenthal. We were interested in something, and er, this is not, this is near Cusco, up in northern Peru, right near Cusco, about 13,000 feet up. This is a cave. It's called the Cave of the Serpent, because you can see over here, this is a serpent that's very, very weathered here, but it's called the Cave of the Serpent. And when I was there, I was met by a shaman. He was the real deal. He knew his stuff. And what he said was that this cave 
was given to them, that it was shown for his ancestors so they would know when the winter solstice was. Now, the winter solstice is June 22nd for them. Okay, us is, it's in December, but for them it's June because they're south of the equator. And what happened was is that this cave has two holes. It's got a hole on top, and it's got a, there's a table inside there, in, in, inside. Let me show you. This is the table I'm talking about. This is the actual granite table. It is cut at a certain angle. You cannot move that table, ever. It is part of the cave, but it's polished. Now you see some water wear here. The reason for that is because there's a hole that goes to the sky. And what happens is that during their winter solstice, the moon comes down, reflects off that table, and lights up the entrance. Now why is that important? Well, to the, the Wall Street uh, lawyer, you don't need to know winter solstice, but this is an agricultural society. You, do, you survive by knowing when to plant. You need to know. If you plant too early, you're ruined. And so that light would come out here in the front entrance, and they would know when to plant. They would start counting their days on when to plant. Why is there a snake there? What's a snake? What's a symbol of snake? Enki is the symbol of the snake. When you look over here to the right, you can't see it here, but he showed us that it's a face-on view of an elephant. There haven't been elephants in South America for over 10,000 years. So you know this is old. And so you know you've got the snake. The snake it stands for Enki. Enki, uh, actually, uh, the ancient Sumerian text for, for Enki is, is, is this, but... His name is Buzor. That's Sumerian. What does that mean? That means uh, the snake. And wise and of the metal mines. Same thing. Now, remember the, the Hebrew text in Genesis? And it said about the Adam and Eve. And it called the snake went in and told Eve, you know, well, that, the term for that in Hebrew is Nahash. Nahash, if you look up in a, in a Hebrew Sumerian dictionary, Nahash is the same thing as Buzor. Same thing. No difference. And it means he of the metal mines, he that understands metal, and the snake. It was Anki that made the mistake of making us too good. That's why we had to be cast off. And uh, this is just an example of how Enki was concerned about us, preserving the humans. And um, I think it's an extremely uh, open lesson about how they nurtured us. And uh, it's really wonderful. Now, you can draw some own conclusions. There are some people that think that perhaps maybe uh, Jesus was a reincarnation of Enki. I don't have any data for that. I don't know anything about that. But it's, but it's, it's really fascinating from that perspective. So I just wanted to start out by just starting out, coming up with, 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 with a, uh, some comments about some of these things that were not necessarily in the book. And, it, it, and I just wanted to show how the, the Genesis story of the Garden of Eden was an allegorical license that was used. Because writing this book was really, really difficult. Because you're talking about going back 450,000 years. A lot of stuff went on there. A lot of things happened there. And remember, these Israelites were just slaves coming out. And you just couldn't explain the whole history. So I think Moses said, you know what? Let's have an, an allegory. Let's have the story about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. And oh. By the way, the word Adam, uh, that's also, uh, uh, that's also Akkadian. That's also Sumerian. Uh, his name was Adamo. And uh, oh, oh, by the way, uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, yeah, Eden's a name. Eden's Sumerian. It's a place. It's right there and where Iraq is today. It's an actual place. And in fact, the Bible says it's a place at the confluence of four rivers. And everybody years ago poo-pooed. They said the Bible didn't know what it's talking about because there's only three. 
There's the Tigris, there's the Euphrates, and then there's the uh, Gesson coming in from, from, uh, from uh, Iran, which today really used to be per, uh, Persia. But it wasn't until 1992, Columbia, from outer space, discovered the fourth river, and that was the Pishon. If you read in the Bible, there's a fourth river, and it goes all the way from the Arabian Mountains to the Havilah. Havilah is Jewish. It's, it's Hebrew for sand land. That's the Arabian Desert. And it goes all the way and then emerges with the Tigris, the Euphrates, and everything. So that was the fourth river. And people for years would say, the Bible doesn't know anything to talk about. There's only three rivers. It wasn't until 1992 discovered, aha, the Bible knew there wasn't. You know, I'm not religious. I don't go to any church or anything like that. But I love old texts. I love to read old texts because somebody penned that down for all of us to, to, to know. And I just, the, the idea thought of somebody reading, penning this down thousands of years ago, and here I am, little old me, I'm reading this stuff. I just love it. I think it's really, really cool. And when I was in college, I was fortunate because math and science was just easy for me. I never had to study. I just had to find something. I couldn't believe anybody had to study for this stuff. But, but I spent most of my time in the library trying to learn the Akkadian language so I can read these, these manuscripts, you know, in their original language. So anyways, I just wanted to start it going with that. And if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and, uh, you, know, you know. Yes, sir. I've got a question. In the Old Testament about the same period, uh, it speaks of a group that came down from the stars. I believe they were referred to as the Nephilim. That's correct. And that is certainly consistent with the picture you are painting. That is correct. The uh, primitive languages, uh, like Hebrew, uh, have a, a, a tetragamatron, which they have one word with multiple meanings. And so they, this was interpreted as giants. If you look at a Hebrew Akkadian dictionary, all right, you see the word Nephilim, which is giants. It is the same thing as Anunnaki, because the root word means those who from the heavens came. Now, there are some people who are good church-going Christians and are, you know, Bible-banging people, which is fine. You know, and they will say, how can you read this trash? It doesn't come from the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. Well, yes, there is. If you go to Exodus, I believe it's chapter 13, verse 33, you will see in there that the word Nephilim is the same thing as Anunnaki. So it's the same thing as saying, oh, by the way, if you happen to be reading some of these cuneiform tablets, like I have been, all right, uh, by the way, uh, Anunnaki is the same thing as Nephilim. So there is an equation there. There's something there, because it means those who from the heavens came. And I don't believe in limiting one's, one's uh, uh, field of investigation. It's all too often they say, don't, don't read this. this, this will lead you astray. I don't agree with that. I think, I, and I think because I was considered mentally retarded, I've reaped enormous advantage from that, because I don't know anything. And so I wanted to investigate everything. And so the Bible, not only uh, is it not in conflict with this thought, it is totally supportive of it. It's it just the, the, the ancient alien theory just leaps from the pages. If I could just add one thing about the Nephilim, I believe that the Old Testament also says, and this is consistent with your genetic um, uh, thread, if you will, that the Nephilim had sexual relations with the humans of the era. That's correct, and we can talk about that. I remember, uh, I, again, I read old things, I'm not very religious, but I found myself at a bar in Queens one time next to a priest, and both of us were getting kind of loaded, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I said, you know what? You're a man of God and man of the cloth and the man of the scripture and everything. Can you make this doesn't this Genesis six thing doesn't make any sense to me? And it talks about the sons of the gods having sex with the daughters of man, and they, they, they looked upon the daughters of man, thought they were fair, and had wives as many as they pleased, and all this other stuff. What does that mean? And he said something I never forgot. He says, Son, 
there are things in the Bible that we're just not meant to understand. And I said, bullshit. Bullshit. Now, when you look at the book of Noah, which they found in the Qumran cave findings, and you look at the book of Enoch, which we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the Ethiopians, because they preserved that book. It was lost. And in those books, they explain everything about this whole thing, about the Anunnaki, and, and how they had, they were not allowed to have sex with the humans. That was against. But they did. And it created a whole nation of demigods. And when you look at the Greek uh, mythology, you hear about all these demigods. That's where they came from. And that is the reason why they had to be destroyed, I believe. And that is the reason why when the children of Israel went into the, to the new world, to, to, the, uh, to Canaan, they said, kill everybody. And when they went into Ea, they went into Jericho, kill everybody. And I think that was probably, it was a cleansing of the DNA. I suspect, anyway. Yes, sir. So as you were uh, calling the Anunnaki, you know, ancient aliens, and then you were saying they were having sex with the organic beings that are here on Earth, so, I mean, what made them so different that created these different types of children? Like, I mean, what defined them as being a god? Is it just their super advanced DNA mixing, or is it that they were interdimensional? Like, I mean... I believe there are two kinds of forms of existence. There is a trinity. There is a trinity in, in the Akkadian religion. There's a trinity in the Sumerian religion, and there's a trinity. And I think you can probably, as far as we can understand, you can probably nail it down to two forms of existence. Those who prefer to live in the flesh and blood, have children, wake up, have a drink of coffee, you know, flesh and blood. And those that prefer to live in the spiritual realm. Remember, if you read the Astrahasis and the, the uh, Numa Elish, and Numa Elish is really, really clear on this, that um, there was a war. And it's always fascinating to me when you read Genesis, it talks about coming, getting his sources. Some of them came from the generations of Adam, and some of them came from uh, uh, the wars of Yahweh. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> what? The wars of Yahweh? I thought Yahweh was God. I didn't need to go to war with anybody. He's God, you know. But no, I think, I think that these are physical beings that prefer to live that way, and they live a long time. If you look at the kings list, you know, where you and I, we're lucky if we make 90 years old. They're doing 30,000 years. They're highly advanced, and they have pure good DNA, because to the world of the Anunnaki, the DNA is king. That's it. You don't mess with that. That's why if you're getting someone that looks like them, and then they're starting thinking about having sex with them, no. You put, a, you put the cap on the bottle, and you separate them because that's the real DNA. Now, what's the reason? Now, then you get into the other section of the book where your soul, you know, your brain is, is not the origin of consciousness. Clearly, it's not the origin of consciousness. You know, I just want to bring it up in case I, I don't later on. If you look, all the books that I write, look in this book. I dedicate it to someone named Charlotte B. McCutcheon. Charlotte B. McCutcheon was she was one of the most brilliant brain scientists I've ever met. And we were good friends. And she actually came up with the idea that Alzheimer's disease might be an autoimmune process. Well, that was thinking outside the box. You don't do that in science. You go with the paradigm. Then she said that she thought that maybe Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, might be an autoimmune process. Well, did you know that just this year they're coming out with scientific evidence that clearly that the brain is, the Alzheimer's disease is an, is an arthritic process of the brain. And the evidence was the same thing. They wanted to kick her out. They wanted to, they, uh, they eventually destroyed her life. How many years ago? This, she, uh, she was actually fired uh, in about 19, 2001, 2002. 2003, the fight was going on. Then around that time, by the time I came here, they booted her out. The, the, the big thing is when she came out and said that the origin of human consciousness is not the brain. 
that did it. Boom. And she was part of a secret society of brain scientists that would gather. I'm talking about real big people. <coughs> and they would gather in secret. And, w and, and they invited me to one of their meetings in Northern Virginia. It was at a Korean restaurant. They bought off the whole restaurant for an evening, everything else. You get your information. You, you get your food. You get your drinks and everything else. The door closes. And nothing that's said in here goes outside. And we've discussed cases. I think I have some of these cases in my book. I don't know whether I did. That were just absolutely incredible. That you would be absolutely convinced that the origin of human consciousness is not the brain. We don't understand. The brain is just a conduit that integrates this fantastic, this fantastic consciousness into the four-dimensional world of space-time that we all live in. <coughs> and they burned her for that. Somebody found out. And they burned her for that, and they ruined her career. Uh, science in this country is not necessarily free. And if, every time I think about it, it makes me angry. And they ruined her life. And you don't see this in Europe. You don't see it in Poland. You don't see it in England, but you see it here. And one of the reasons, I think, is because of money. It's big money. You write books, you believe in a certain way, the data becomes secondary, the selling the books becomes everything. This is the Sphinx, all right? We're told that the Sphinx was created around 2500 BC, all right? It's in the books. It's in all the books that are sold to the university. Look at that. Number one, look at the head. It's small in comparison with the rest of the body. Look how the head is so much in better condition than the rest of the body, despite the fact that the head is exposed. Finally, this guy says, you know what? Why don't we get somebody who knows something about dating date the Sphinx? Who would know about dating carved rock? A geologist. So let's go to the best e e geologist that we have in the world, probably, and that is Robert Schock, Boston University, went over there spent a year dating this thing, doing a whole analysis. You know, the Sphinx sp spends most of its time in sand. He researched. Now, he's got no bone to pick. He's got, he's got no free, private agenda or anything like that. He dated the Sphinx, and he says, no way was this thing built 2,500 <laughs> B.C. This thing is at least 7,000 B.C., maybe 10,000 B.C., an area of human history we don't have any knowledge of. Well, and he made his report in 1992 in the journal Nature, the American Association of Advancement of Science. I happen to still be a member of that until they kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> but to this day, if you look at these, uh, uh, you study Egyptian history, you won't mention him. And by the way, he's not invited back to Egypt. It was the most, one of the most brilliant minds. It, it, sometimes in academia, they're not really searching for truth. I have no idea sometimes what they're searching for, you know. But there's no, look at the, look, the weather here, is the, it was rain. It was rain wear. It was on the Sphinx. Now, it hasn't rained in Egypt in a long time. They get their crops by inundation from the Nile. So by doing so, he realized that, you know, the history needs to be rewritten, and they refuse to do it. And that's it. But his name is Robert Schock. It changed Robert Schock. Now he's really investigating a lot of these other enigmas. And he really is doing a wonderful job uh, with that. Any other questions? If the Nephilim were here at that time, you're saying Anki and his wife had bred with the local fauna, would that have been, you know, like Neanderthals, right? I mean, why, why would such a superior race want to have sex with, like, you know, gorillas. I mean, basically, it was kind of... Well, they weren't gorillas. They were humans. So you're... They were human-like. They were, they were human-like. They weren't, they weren't Neanderthal. But still, it's just odd to me. You know, I mean, I could see where they were kind of trying to make a race to work for them and mine gold or whatever was so important to the Anunnaki, but um, was that their breeding base? 
what, what did they take it from? Was it the Neanderthals that well, were roaming you, around? You read time? the scripture, and the scripture says they looked upon the daughters of men, and they were fair. They wow. must have been pretty hot looking. Yeah, they must have been, you know? I mean, you know, I mean it, never underestimate the, the value of sex, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's probably my teenage years. I, I read something, an article, um, where we're we going to just look at the UFO. I, I don't remember adding the names or anything. It was uh, one of the theories uh, was that we had people in the future studying the past. So I think that's probably where we can get the DNA that, that, that you know, people in the future probably have higher intelligence level than we do. And uh, going to the past, maybe going way back in the past. And um, if you were going to look at them, um, if you're saying Neanderthals um, or, or lesser beings, they probably would look at them as godlike, especially if they have high intelligence and stuff like that. Have you um, come across with any of your colleagues or anybody that study that because I can't seem to find that article. I can't even remember it. It was, it was, it was, I had come across it because I was doing some kind of research, but it wasn't, um, I, I think at the time I was doing Vishnu and reincarnation and yeah. stuff, and I, I came across that because it was, um, at the time they were doing the, uh, the, the popularity of, oh, we're spotting UFOs and stuff, yeah. and that was one of the theories that... And that's a good point, because you're talking about are these people so advanced that they can jump time? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that we're looking at our future and they're coming down to investigate us. That's a great thought. And I love to think about things like that, but there's no data on that, mm -hmm. you know. Because they were, it, it's, it's funny because they, they were said to have, you know, come, you know, in, in the past to, uh, to, uh, to, to study us. And, and what I'm seeing today is, um, you know, how our, our generation, we used to, uh, well, our parents' generation, uh, they have letters, like, you know, they write back and forth to, the, to their loved ones and to their, to, to their uh, uh, you know, they have their romantic uh, interests and they make movies out of it. And then I look at my generation and the generation after me. We have our um, telephones, you know, our, our iPads and stuff, and, and we write and when we text each other. Well, we delete those. We have nothing. So I'm thinking, well, you know what, now it makes sense because I'm trying, I'm trying to tie things together. In the future, we have nothing written down, and so yeah. what? What are the? What is the future going to look at? I mean, we have nothing. So maybe because they're so far advanced that they probably go back and. Yeah, I don't think there's much that they can learn from us. I can pretty much guarantee <laughs> you that. How can we destroy the world, right? Let me tell you. You're talking about the UFO. Let me mm -hmm. let me delve into this a little bit. You know, some of you know I was um, I was privileged to uh, be the private neurologist to the director of CIA, William Casey. Uh, that was during the Reagan administration. I made several visits to the White House. I was always escorted with the Secret uh, Service uh, through the West Wing. And um, I've learned many things. And some of the secrets I, I came out in the book, some of the stuff I didn't, I didn't put out. But one of the things that I learned was uh, 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 it was called Project Jennifer. Project what? Jennifer. Yeah. Let me tell you the story. And I think you'll understand where these Anunnaki are coming from. Back in 1968, March of 19, I think it was March of 1968, there was a Russian submarine. It was a golf class submarine. It was a diesel electric submarine. It had three engines, and it was a diesel electric. It was fashioned off the Type 21 German U boats that they constructed just prior to the end of World War II. It's a primitive submarine. They developed on this submarine a way to launch missiles. There were three of them behind the conning tower, and they were what they call R-21s. They have a radius of about 300 miles, and they can detonate nuclear weapons. At this time before this, Russia has been selling these types of submarines to China. They've been selling nuclear materials to China. Now, many of you may not realize that in, in the Soviet Union during the time of Brezhnev, Brezhnev did not have absolute control of the nuclear weapons. It was the KGB that controlled the nuclear weapons. The secretary generals have been very concerned about this ever since Eisenhower. So they went to us, starting with Eisenhower, then with Kennedy, and then with Johnson. And they said, can you help us with a fail-safe mechanism so that if they try to fire these things, 
something, they won't fire or they'll blow up. Now, you can get to a nuclear device and you can attach an explosive to it and it, 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 it will not detonate. It requires precision in order to detonate a nuclear device. So it'll just blow up and be worthless. There, the man that really controlled power uh, in the Soviet Union was a man named Mikhail Suzlov. He was a kingmaker and he was a king breaker. He had an evil, devious plan. And he, what he was going to do was get one of these submarines near Hawaii, fire it on Hawaii, on Oahu, and then we would investigate and we would discover that it was the Chinese that did it. And we would go to war with the Chinese and then they would reap the benefit. He was destined that Russia was going to rule the, the world and communism was going to take over. So what happened is they positioned the boat. They didn't have Polaris missiles in those days. They had the surface and then they went to fire it off. They did not have the final four digits. So what happened is the missile blew up, blew up the conning tower, the sub sank. Another, another fellow on our side is a brilliant oceanographer named, Dave, named uh, John Craven. And he set up this thing called SOSIS with the sounding devices all throughout the ocean. And he was able to pick up where this K-129 submarine sank. He was able to pinpoint it better than the Russians could because they didn't have this. Well, the, a lot of people don't, don't know this, but uh, the Navy wasn't the only uh, department in, in the United States that had a nuclear submarine. CIA had a nuclear submarine. It was an old submarine. It was called the Halibut. And it used to have what they call the bat cave on it because in those days it would have to fire with a very primitive cruise missile called the Regulus. CIA said, this is wonderful because we can get all our technicians and our, all our engineers and everything else and we can put all sophisticated electronic equipment in here and we can do whatever you want underwater. And if you want to find something underwater, a submarine is your best bet because there's no concern about weather or anything like that. You can go down right close to it and, and, and they found it. They found, they found where it was blown off, found the markings, found the sub. Now, the rumor was going around in the CIA that there was a sailor in the Soviet Union that kept a diary. You do not do that in the military. In the Soviet Union, they pick you up. Here in the U.S., they court-martial you. You do not keep diaries. And they were after the diary because they wanted to know and wanted to be able to blackmail Russia. Well, as this was going on, uh, Nixon w was informed of this. And that is the reason why Nixon went to China and started our business relationship with China. Here's Nixon, the anti-communist, goes to China. We're not going to have any of that. We're going to have communication now. We're going to have business with each other so we, nothing like this ever happens again. Well, let me tell you something. In order for Mikhail Suvlov to get this plan into fruition, he had to get his boy head of the KGB. Who was his boy? His boy was a guy named Andropov. Andropov was a Jew, but he was an atheist, strong atheist, so he really wasn't religious. And he became head of the KGB. Now he's got his boy in there, and, and now he can cause this thing to go into fruition. Did you know? When this whole thing was coming out, if you wanted to see a UFO, all you had to do was go to North Dakota, Montana, South Dakota, this Mel Stream Air Force Base, boom, because they were all over the place. And if you want, I can show you a short video of uh, Robert Salas, who was there. And I think maybe this is the time, this may be the time to do it. Good afternoon, my name is Robert Solace. In uh, 1967, I was a first lieutenant uh, stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. I was a missile launch officer. Um, and in, in March, 
On March 24, 1967, I was on duty at uh, what we called Oscar Flight. It is a uh, underground capsule, uh, hardened site, uh, about 60 feet underground. We had uh, security guards topside. Uh, the main guard is called a flight security controller. Uh, my commander at the time was uh, Lieutenant Fred Mywald, now Colonel, retired Colonel Fred Mywald. Uh, it, sometime in the evening hours on March 24th, I, I received a call from one of my t uh, topside guards, the flight security controller, stating that they had been observing strange lights in the sky, making odd maneuvers, um, and wanted to report it. Uh, I thought it was kind of a strange report, but uh, I took it seriously. Uh, you have to understand we were protecting nuclear weapons, and uh, we, uh, the reports we generally got were very professional. Uh, at any rate, uh, I kind of dismissed the call. He called back uh, about five minutes later. This time he was screaming into the phone saying uh, they're uh, looking uh, at an object, uh, a red glowing object hovering just above our front gate. Uh, this object was about 30 feet in diameter. Uh, he couldn't make out too much of the details of the object, only that it was uh, pulsating and, uh, and uh, he had all the guards out there. He was very frightened, uh, wanted me to give him direction. I think I said something like, make sure nothing comes inside the perimeter fence. Uh, he immediately hung the phone up. We, um, I went to wake my commander, Fred Myron, who was taking a, a rest break. Started to tell him about the phone call, and uh, just as I told him, uh, our missiles began going into what's called a no-go condition or unlaunchable, essentially they were disabled, while this object was still uh, hovering over our site, our launch control facility. Uh, at that point, we went through our procedures. He reported to, back to the command post the incident. We also had some security lights, uh, meaning uh, security incursions at some of the launch facilities. Uh, so I called the guard back upstairs and um, directed that a security team be sent out. At this point, the guard told me the object had left at high speed. Again, silent. No noise. Uh, the security guards got out to the launch facility and reported back that they were seeing this object again. Um, they also lost radio contact. Uh, the, uh, this incident uh, terminated at that point. We, uh, we reset the, the security alarms, but the, uh, the missiles themselves were still disabled. Uh, we had to call in for maintenance, uh, maintenance teams to come out and, uh, and bring them back up on alert. The, uh, the main indication we got from our equipment was this was uh, guidance and control system failure. Um, I, I want to I emphasize that the um, security people upstairs had no control authority over, they had no equipment up there, no ability to affect any kind of... Um, uh, system shut down on our missiles. All, all the control systems were underground. Um, we were relieved the next morning. I reported back to the command post. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the base, Malmstrom, uh, reported to our squadron commander. Uh, he was white as a sheet, didn't know how to explain the event. He's, he, uh, I asked him specifically if it could have been an Air Force exercise, and he assured me that it was not an Air Force exercise. Um, there was also a member of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations in, uh, in the room. He uh, ordered us to not ever talk about this. Um, I even signed a non-disclosure statement to that effect. Uh, this was, and I didn't talk about it, um, uh, until 1994 I was able to um, come across a, a little uh, paragraph in a book called Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. And on page 301 of that book, uh, there's a, a, small, a short paragraph about uh, uh, missiles being shut down while UFOs were overhead. 
At that point, uh, with the help of uh, Mr. James Klotz, my investigator, uh, we requested the Air Force to send us documents about this shutdown, not, not mentioning the word UFO. Uh, we, we did get the Air Force to declassify what was what we call the echo flight incident. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, during uh, the report to the command post, uh, my, my commander, Fred Myall, turned to me and said the same thing happened at another site. At, at the time, I thought he meant that that evening, but uh, it turns out the same thing had happened a week earlier at another site, and, and he was probably referring to the echo flight. Uh, at any rate, uh, at that point, when we start, when we got the echo flight incident declassified, I was able, to, or I felt I was able to come forward and start talking about it because I thought that's where I was. It wasn't until later I found out it was an Oscar flight, and I realized that not only our flight had gone down of uh, ten missiles, but uh, the echo flight also went down uh, about a week earlier on March 16th. We had extensive uh, documentation on the Echo Flight incident uh, that we received from the Air Force under Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we have the testimony of um, Walt Fiegel, who was the Deputy uh, Missile Crew Commander at Echo Flight. Um, we have, uh, I have a couple letters from the Commander, Eric Carlson, uh, Colonel Mywald uh, has uh, gave me a, a radio I'm sorry, a telephone interview about this in 1996, and I've got that on tape, and he's given me permission to use that. So we've got audio recordings of, of some of these witnesses. We've got written statements. We've got documentation from the Air Force, all of this supporting what I just told you. Uh, I'll have more to say a little bit later about um, where I think we should go from here. But right now, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Where I'm heading is a mystery. I'm shifting like the sand. You know, what's the lesson from this? What is it? You're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. This is, this is not our planet. This is their planet. We can do what we want. We can pillage. We can destroy. We can choose our own government if we want. But we don't screw around with nuclear weapons. And, and you can almost hear what they're thinking. Once they know this plan was going to go into fruition, and they say, hey, John, why don't you send a couple of UFOs down there to Maelstream and see if we can shut these damn things off. And that's what, you know, once you, once you spin down a missile, it takes 24 hours to spin it back up again. It's not just like you can't fire, you, you plug it in again and it fires. And it's a huge, sophisticated process. So you can almost just hear them saying, hey, John, you know, why don't you send a couple of UFOs just to make sure we can turn everything off if we have to with these insane people, you know, because uh, this is not our planet. This is theirs. Then you have to ask yourself, what's it all about? What is it, what's their interest in the game? There was a guy, I forgot his name, it was the turn of the century to last century, thought about this too, and I forgot his name. And he came up with this concept that this is a DNA farm. And I think that's what this is. Because there's two kinds of, those that prefer to live in the spiritual plane and those that prefer to live in the physical plane. And to that world, DNA is everything. And that may be the reason why we have these abductions from time to time. It's these probes, you know, probes of the animal, animal mutilations, whatever. Maybe that's part of it. Because what do they look at? They want to see where we're going with this DNA thing. But don't screw around with the planet because thermonuclear weapons is devastating. It, it, it just ruins the biosphere. And that's not going to be allowed. And I think that's the take home message from this. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, me too. Absolutely. I'm not too happy. With all this uh, research that you're doing on Mars now, I mean, it seems so evident to me that that planet had been uh, occupied by our species 
so to speak, and uh, we destroyed it. And, you know, when you read about people like uh, Richard Branson and other people, you know, wanting to uh, populate, go, you know, go, go to Mars and, and find, in other words, find another planet to populate because they feel that Earth is, is not going to be viable, that, that it will be destroyed. I mean, w how does that play into all of this? Well, I think um, my view is this. You know, I believe in evolution. I think evolution is a process that works. But, um, you know, Alfred Wallace was Darwin's right-hand man who helped put all this stuff together. And it was his belief, yes, evolution works, but there's some other hand into it that we don't understand. That, that every once in a while goes ahead and it's like a garden that you have to nurture. You have to get the weeds out, you have to do something. And I wonder sometimes if that ain't probably correct. You know, um, you know uh, probably the greatest astrophysicist in our time was a guy named uh, Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle. 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 Fred Hoyle was a fella, was the guy who discovered stellar nuclear synthesis. One of the biggest discoveries of our time. This shows how, how elements heavier than uh, carbon are formed in the universe. They're formed in, st in stellar. Uh, heavier elements come from Noma, Novas. And the, 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 the lighter ones come from the sun. It's called, we used to call it the carbon cycle. Now they call it the triple alpha phenomenon. And you get helium. You fuse helium with helium. You get beryllium. It's unstable. And then, then you add another helium to it. You get carbon. Carbon's stable. So you build up your carbon. And then you start getting your oxygen. It was Fred Hoyle who discovered all this stuff. One of the most brilliant astrophysicists, I think, in our time. He did not get the Nobel Prize. You know why? because he was too brilliant. He was thinking outside the box. And there was, uh, you've heard of pulsars. Well, the guy who got the credit for the pulsar, the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, didn't even mention the woman scientist that did all the data, did all the work, and did all the discovery. And he was pissed off about that. You don't mess with the paradigm. Also, he said some other crazy things. He said something like, the only conclusion that he can draw, and he was an agnostic, he was not religious at all, that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and created the universe. Now, you are not going to get the Nobel Peace Prize if you say something like that. That's way outside the paradigm. It's not going to happen. And so here's a guy who really deserved to get it, uh, by anybody's admission, didn't get it. And he said some things, that, and it reminds me of Charlotte B. McCutcheon that wrote that. Thought outside the box, they're just too brilliant for these minds. And so consequently, they want to destroy them. Let me give you a small example. What does it take for the universe to have life? Well, we all accept the Big Bang Theory, correct? Yeah. Now, when you have the Big Bang, there's two forms of physics that are developed, laws of physics, one outside the atom and the other one inside the atom. The one outside the atom is a certain rate that the universe has to expand. And you have to be within one-tenth of one percent. If you're not, it's just going to be a cloud dust that goes off infinitum. If it's too less, it'll fall back on itself. There'll be no suns, no planets, no stars, no nothing. No stars. No minerals above, no, there'll be no, nothing above hydrogen, hardly, to speak of. Maybe a little helium. That's it. So no life. Now what about inside it? What about the quantum laws that are developed at the Big Bang? This is a relationship between gravity and electromotive force. That also has to be exactly one-tenth of one percent. Otherwise, what's going to happen is your stars will be so big you won't get any minerals. They'll be so small, they'll burn up. You won't have enough time to have life. That's how precise it is, and he knew that. That's why he said some super intellect probably monkeyed with physics. Now, some people would say it's all serendipity, that we're, we're saying it's wonderful because we experienced it. 
Well, the probability numbers don't work that way. Because you look at the Big Bang, every time you roll the dice on the Big Bang, you got a 50-50 chance that you can't do it again. Because if it goes too fast, they'll expand and they'll never come back. So you're done, like that. This just came out this month in National Geographic magazine. You read this statement here, tiny little brains stuck in those bodies that were not so tiny. Weird as hell. Well, it's about time somebody <laughs> thinks about this. I've been thinking about it for, for decades. Yeah, it's weird as hell. I don't care, they get bigger and they get bigger, they get more erect and everything else. The brain is always the same. And then all of a sudden, 450,000 years ago, bam, size of the human. And when the, our ancient forefathers, or ancient Sumerians, tell us, oh, hey, by the way, this is how it worked. This is, it was 450,000 years ago they came down here, and this is what they did. And they even give us examples of the mistakes that were made. So, yeah, evolution. I believe in evolution, but I think there's more to our history than just evolution. You know. And I've often wondered, you know, if I... In fact, I'm sort of reluctant to get really well known about this because they'll probably come after me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ready for them. I love a good fight. <laughs> Here's a question. But going there's one third. It's always one third, one third, one third, okay. one third, and then bam, you get you get uh, uh, you get uh, uh, Heidelberg Genesis, and bam, you got the 98 percent of the human brain. Here's a question. Here's a question going to that that I think is is really interesting because. They're here, they're on our planet. Tens of thousands of years before this one third happened, what's your take on the cetacean brain? Because the cetacean brain had the cranial capacity that it has now tens of thousands of years before this one third happened, and they had the convolutions on the brain that in, in neurological science, I mean, you may dispute that, but that said that it was, that was a point of intelligence. And so <laughs> tens of thousands of years before we saw any growth, they were there. And, and, and I've been fascinated with cetacean since I was 10 years old, that they have to lower their voice four, five, six octaves for us to even hear them. Yeah. And they live in this in completely different world that we do, and they have these gigantic brains, and they don't have to build anything, they don't have to do anything, but they're so incredibly social. So what, how, does, how do the cetaceans on the planet fit with this idea of, of, of intelligence? You know, I think there are probably other realms that we don't understand, and I'll be always open-minded. For instance, there's this pit that was a um, fossil pit in Texas, and here you got dinosaur tracks, and right next to it, you got tracks that look like primate, human. Well, go figure. And it can't be fake because they was discovered there was a huge uh, sandstone over it that had to be broken apart and lifted above, so nobody can go in there and fake that, you know. So go figure. Is, was, was this planet a penal colony, you know, that they just take bad people that they didn't like during the dinosaurs and say, throw them down here and say, uh, you'll be food for dinosaurs? I don't know. I believe that. I don't know, you know. But, but the, you know. Point is, the point is, it's like, how, how do dolphins and whales with their enormous, much larger than us, their brains, yeah. and since you're a neuro... Uh, you know, a neurologist, how does that fit in well, to, it, to the scheme yeah. of things with, um, with the rest of the uh, life? Well, people, uh, animals, especially mammals, are adapted to their environment. I dissected a, a porpoise brain one time. I was truly amazed. But one thing that I learned from that was the porpoise brain has a huge occipital area. It is monstrous compared to our own. And I really uh, realized then and there that when they emit a sound, they see it. Right. They actually see it. And, and so they have a big brain because of that. Now, some people would ask, how is it that a porpoise can go down 500 feet and hang around for a long time, and then he comes back up to the surface and he doesn't get bent? Right? He doesn't get the bends. If you do it, you'd probably get killed. Well, the reason is, is because in a porpoise, their lungs collapse. So they're not introducing any more gas under pressure into the bloodstream. So they can stay down there as long as they want, and they never get bent. It's a wonderful adaptation of, of, of evolution. 
Yeah, but it's, it's, it, all this stuff is very fascinating, no, no question about it. But I think, I think the, uh, the human conscious, let me give you another example. Uh, I was reading one day uh, the, the journal Nature. The, journal, the editor of Journal Nature is a guy named Guy. He's, uh, he is a, uh, an evolutionary biologist, very interesting fellow, very bright. They're starting to believe now that the advent of speech and language in the human brain didn't come about until 50,000 years ago. Well, how did that happen? Well, what happened shortly after that or before that? It was the Toba catastrophe. Toba catastrophe. That was, that was in the Sumatra. And now they call it the Toba Lake. It used to be a mountain. Blew up. Entered in another nice little ice age. Killed off almost all the humans. There are only about 1,000, no more than 10,000 left. And then after that, you start developing language. How did that happen? Well, it's called the founder principle. Okay? Founder principle means let's eliminate these people. And then let's manipulate this gene, and then that's what's going to grow up. That's called the founder principle. And I've often suspected that maybe that's what happened. They thought the language wasn't really evolving fast enough for them. So then they detonated this, blew it up, killed off everybody except for a few, manipulated the genes, which is the Fox gene, for language. It's a very complicated mechanism, language, because you have to have the proper throat, you have to have Broca's areas. You have to have Wernicke's area of the brain all developed so you understand speech, and then you can enunciate speech, and then you can phonate speech. It's very complicated. And then all of a sudden, 50,000 years ago, boom, we have this. You know, and so it's, it's, a, it's food for thought. It's nothing proof, nothing like that. But it's, a, it's, it's interesting to think about. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, I mean... We're going with the, uh, you know, the concept that you know, we're seeded, right? You know, our DNA is seeded. You know, they've upgraded our DNA. Why, why, why a focus on speech and why not just telepathy? Is there something you know, powerful about speech? That's why they wanted to make us perfect it? Well, I think speech is a lot easier. The speech is the world we live in. It's a 3D world that we live in. You know, X, Y, Z in time. Then how would you know, different other animals like... For example, many birds or, or fish, you know, they all swim together and they all fly together in flocks. And yeah. I mean, it's so coordinated without them physically speaking to each other. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody understands that. You know, the, the turtles migrate across the ocean. And the, the occurring running theory is, is that at one time, you know, the South America was aligned uh, with Africa and it was just a stream, it was just a river. And so they would go across the river. They kept doing it, doing it, and, and expand, expand, and expand it. And then they, they were going across the ocean. You know, you know, maybe, but it's amazing. No question about it. It's amazing. Yeah. Just to get off of the DNA, since we, earlier we had spoken about that this earth belonged to, to them, whoever them is, or, or them are. Um, my question is, is that have we ever thought about that this planet could be a jail cell for us, <laughs> you know. Um, you know how we have said that um, DNA, DNA, DNA. Yes, maybe we're rejects of the, um, the, the the true intellect. That maybe you know how we have the white mouse that we do experiments on. Maybe we are being experimented on, and maybe they're saying, okay, well, we have these because we know that not everyone is at the same intellectual level that we should, <laughs> I was actually going to say we should be, but that, that we are all at. Um, some are uh, less uh, intelligent than others, and some of them were like, really? Um, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know, we're talking about UFOs and that this, this Earth, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for other Earths, uh, or not Earth, but other planets to make like ours. Um, has there been other people thinking that, hey, you know what? Maybe this isn't really a place of, you know, we are actually has, uh, really smart people that, you know, we, we've been put on this planet and we actually were supposed to be here as a, um, a sentence, you know. We'll say, you know, how sometimes we have children that are born for, uh, for three hours and then they die and then we mourn and say, why are, we, you know, why are these children dead in three hours? And, 
then we have people living till they're 110. Maybe that's their sentence on this well, earth. Well, I'll tell you, the, the, that is precisely the reason why, when you have this equation, you have to include with it the origin of consciousness. Because without that, you're going to go nowhere. Once you realize that you are not your brain, that you are something else, it's a spirit, you're maybe even older than the universe, but you're sent down here to learn, to experience things, and that way your character grows. And I'm absolutely convinced of that, because when I, I was very fortunate when I had a practice in Maryland, I was busy. Five hospitals, five intensive care units, a trauma center, I taught at uh, Georgetown, I taught, uh, I even taught Howard residents when they went through Prince George's uh, Hospital. I, I, I just was in, in mesh, and when you're enmeshed with that one, you're going to see patients that have been dead and come back. And I would never believe in this stuff, never. But I had one, one patient of mine that changed my life. I won't give you his name, but he changed my life. His first name was Walter, but I, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> one day he was walking down the street, and he had a cardiopulmonary arrest. That means his heart stopped beating. That means he stopped breathing. That means he was dead. Now, he goes, he, 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 they sent him over to Atlanta, the doctor's hospital, Atlanta, Maryland. I was the vice president, the, I'm the vice, the, the, actually a chairman of, uh, the vice chairman of the board there. So I get called, he's in a little cubicle, dead as Caesar, all right? <laughs> Finally, we get the heart going. He's still in coma, and we send him up to the intensive care unit. Gradually, a few days later, he regains consciousness, right? So I did a CAT scan of the brain. I normally don't do CAT scan of the brain with contrast because I don't know this guy could be allergic to it. It could be fatal. So I do a non-contrast CAT scan of the brain, clean as a whistle, brain is fine, no problem. So he finally recovers as the time goes on. And he was discharged about a week, 10 days later. I said, we're going to get an MRI of your brain. I'm going to see you in my office. So he goes over, gets a contrast MRI of the brains. He comes back with his wife. His, mother, his wife is over here. He's sitting over here. He says, Dr. Weischer, I was dead. I says, I know you were dead. Everybody knows you were dead. You were there. You know, got your heart beating and everything else. He says, you don't understand. I was outside my body. And I saw everything. You know. And he described what transpired inside this little cubicle. Then he said, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel, a light. And I said, I felt this desire to go into that light. And so he did. And he went into that light faster than the speed of light. Then suddenly he finds himself on this beautiful landscape. And so I'm thinking, bullshit. You know, <laughs> your brain's playing tricks with you. These are hallucinations. This is not really the real deal. He said something I never forgot. He says, Dr. Weister, I'm older than you. That means I've had more dreams than you've had. This was no dream. This was more real than you in front of me now. I asked questions. I received answers. And he described it. He said there was a beautiful mountainside to the left. There was a stream coming down in the center. There was a bridge over the stream. There was a huge tree on the other side. And he saw some people standing there. So he thought, oh, I'm going to go over there and visit these people. Turned out to be his dead father, his dead uncle, and his dead brother. And they were all going, high five, how you doing, you know? So this guy comes up and taps him on the shoulder. Now, I'm not religious, okay? This is nothing, but this happened. He tapped on the shoulder, he turned around, he looked at him, and said, who are you? I don't recognize him. He said, my name was Jesus. He says, well, I'm sorry, I don't believe in you. He said, well, I was a historical figure, and I want you to know we're all proud of you, because by virtue of the fact you didn't have any religion, you were honest in all your business dealings. <coughs> and everybody's just tickled pink and proud of you on how you lived your life. And it turned out that Walter was a very, very wealthy businessman. Made a lot of money. And one of the reasons why he was honest in everything he did. And he was a real estate developer worth millions and millions of dollars. So he's sitting here telling me this story. But he says, you know, my brother that died was a sailing fanatic. His whole life was sailing. So he says, yeah, I want to come over. I want to show you my sailboat. So he goes over and shows him a sailboat. And he says it was about 120 feet long. And he's looking at the lifeline on it. And it's a rope. And in the grooves of the ropes were diamonds and rubies and sapphires and all kinds of stuff. It was absolutely incredible. 
So he told me his brother was sitting there with his hand on the wheel like this. It was like a racing wheel. And he told his brother, he said, this place is really cool. I really, really, really don't want to go back to Earth. Okay, this is really cool. And his brother told him, you have to go back to Earth. You have to tell this story. But don't worry. You're only going to be in the Earth a short period of time because you're terminally ill. You're going to be coming back. And he thought to himself, yippee, I'm terminally ill. Cool, you know. This is a true story. He's telling me this. In the old days of the MRI, you had to have a viewer. Remember those days? You had to have the whole thing. You put it up in a viewer. And I'm putting this thing up in a viewer. There on the MRI of the brain was a glioblastoma multiforme. He died six months later. Nobody on this planet knew that he was terminally ill. But he knew he was terminally ill when he came through because they told him up there that he was terminally ill. Where's up there? God knows. <laughs> God knows. <laughs> hey, Dave. God knows. Dave, you told me stories about somebody flying out of the window in the hospital up, up in the States and telling about shoes out there that they would never be able to see if they not if they're lying in a bed and all that stuff, you told me stories. There's so many good books. There's Brian a White lot stuff, of stories. Many lives, many masters. Right. There excellent is, book. Right, yeah, excellent book. There, uh, and Paul Anderson. Yeah. If you really want to know about that thing, there's really things afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And your, right, your book is some of the other books yeah. that they can read. And right oh, now, God. there are brilliant minds that are coming with this very issue. Something that. Charlotte McCutcheon's, Dr. McCutcheon's life was ruined over. And we've got people like Roger Penrose. A lot of people don't know Roger Penrose, but they know Stephen Hawkins, right? Roger Penrose is Stephen Hawkins' right-hand scientist. They work together. And he believes now, they concluded, that the origin of human consciousness is probably quantum mechanical. But fortunately, thank God, they can't touch him. He's way up there. And so, uh, so also uh, Stuart Hammerhoff. These are brilliant, brilliant minds that are coming to this finally the same conclusion that the or that the brain is this mushroom thing we call a brain is nothing more than a conduit between this other world we know nothing about and this world that we live in now. And I think that uh, I think the evidence for that is compelling, and that's why I had that chapter in the book. And I also had the chapter on reincarnation. Because once you, once you understand that, that the brain is a conduit, then reincarnation is not that far. You know, remember Voltaire, with a famous French philosopher, said, it's no greater miracle to be born twice than it is once. So what is your theory on gaining, I was again, knowledge, you know, outside of self? You know, since, I mean, knowledge being nonlinear, you know, tapping into an <coughs> external knowledge base and... I guess gathering information you would have not known from reading books. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, being quiet. I did that. I tell you, a lot of this stuff started to make sense for me. And you don't have to be practicing Buddha or anything like that. It's just being quiet. A lot of this stuff was at an April, April Newland's house in, 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 uh, in uh, St. Bart's, sitting over there, having a glass of wine, smoking a cigar, having all the manuscripts, watching the waves come in. I think, I think certain spaces, places are quite spiritual. And I, that air, I never forgot that day when it all started to come together for me. And it was there. So I think there's something spiritual about that. Dave, we're going yeah. to last question. But, but in the meantime, okay, so in the meantime, you talk about ancient aliens. Okay, now. Where are they coming from? Is there like one planet out there that they're coming from? Or like, do they, are they still coming? Or is it only, was it just that one place in time that they came and changed everything up? Or like, no, no. how does it come to well, today? Well, if you read Genesis, it said, in those days there were the Nephilim, the giants. And it also says, they never left. No, they no, never left. Yeah. And sometimes when you actually see a UFO, it's probably a cloaking failure. The, the cloaking device has failed, and then you see them. Because I believe they can. I saw one over the ocean behind my house one time. I saw a metal tube structure, and it was just going like, not in a typical flight plan, no wings, no vertical stabilizers, no horizontal stabilizers, no noise. And so I get my Steider binoculars out, I'm looking at this thing, and then all of a sudden, bam, it's gone. 
But do we have any idea where they're from, or like, do they just come from? Like well, Zachariah Sitchin said they come from a planet called Nibiru, but I, I don't accept that. I think I have I have my own interpretation of Nibiru, planet Nibiru. Donald Trump is one of them. Well, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to. <laughs> but hey, that's, uh, that's in the book. It's in the book. We have some books of, of uh, Dr. Uh, alien abductions are, the Anunnaki are responsible for alien abductions? You know, I, when I wrote this book, I wanted to use data that is very difficult to refute. Alien abductions is very hard to talk about. It probably is true. I think it is because they do sampling techniques, and I think it's DNA that they're interested in. So I, I, I don't think I it's that far-fetched. As biologists, that's what we do, is we yeah. tag things, and then we periodically recapture them yeah. to measure them. So to me, it makes total sense that if you have implanted <coughs> something in somebody, you right. want to periodically recapture that person. And you may be absolutely and entirely right. And, and see what the data yeah. shows. Yeah, I think you may be absolutely right. Yeah. But I, when I wrote this book, this is the data. If you don't believe me, Go to the source. But I, I wanted something small that everybody can read and, and be absolutely almost irrefutable. I wanted to say something. I wanted to thank you for the courage as a scientist and a physician to do this research and make it public. Secondly, I, I, I've done a lot of... It, it takes a lot of courage. I'm, I'm a creature of Washington, D.C. for much of my career, and I know the risks. And some of them are quite real, I mean, shockingly real. Secondly, on this alien abduction issue, um, there has been a lot of work done. The, a premier uh, researcher in this field was Dr. John Mack, a, a, a physician and psychiatrist at Harvard. They tried to kick him out, but, but in any event, he has that there are some very interesting things that are very consistent with the golden thread that has come to light by people that experience so-called alien abductions. They have had, number one, sexual encounters with, with these creatures. Number two, they have seen hybrids, human-alien hybrids. Number three, that it has been told to them that this is all Earth is like a school. And then also, they have said, when people say, well, what gives you the right to, to put me on a laboratory table? They, they say cryptically, we have the right. And so, you know, to me, this is all, you know, consistent with the golden thread and the idea that, that uh, you know, whose planet is there? Who are we? I, I don't know. But I want to thank Dr. Weisher for writing about it. Yeah. Well, if, if they come after me, I'm ready for them. <laughs>